So I'm going to start down the end with Sherry um, Langemack. Um, Sherry is a physician and a digital health strategist. Um, she works as the Director of Innovation and Business Development at the Swiss clinic Serenio, which is a center for uh, neurology and rehabilitation. Um, Sherry works on reinventing stroke rehabilitation with the help of new digital tools um, and care processes. Um, she also advises a number of startups and investors. Um, she graduated from um, the Ludwig uh, Maximilian University of Munich with a degree in medicine, um, and she has gained experience in um, London and Shanghai. Um, she's finished her PhD um, in um, psychiatry, and she also has an MBA from the IE Business School in Madrid. Uh, sitting next to Shari is um, Shajil Khan. Um, Shajil is um, completing his PhD um, at KAUST um, in Saudi Arabia um, in electrical engineering. Um, he previously had a master's from Georgia Tech um, where he was a Fulbright scholar. Um, and um, he is here representing um, a spin-out company, MMH Labs. Um, it's spinning out of the research that he's doing um, currently um, in his PhD work. Um, and that he's working in sustainable materials uh, making senses of the future. Um, then, sorry, I've got this out of order. Next to Shajil is um, Joseph um, Curcio, so I'm not sure if I pronounced your name correctly, <laughs> um, um, who has over 20 years of engineering and consulting experience um, in um, electromechanical engineering and the robotics field. Um, he has uh, master's degrees in engineering and systems management from MIT. Um, in um, the design and development of unmanned marine vehicles. He is the CEO of Kynaptic, um, which is developing a novel wearable technology that is poised to revolutionize how humans and intelligent machines interact. Um, so it's a, it's a haptic human machine interface technology. So I'm excited to hear more about that. Um, and um, one of the things that I think is um, particularly interesting um, in reading Joseph's bio is that um, I guess you currently live in Maine and um, are getting into or, or very heavily involved in sailing. So um, we are interested to hear a bit more about that. And then finally, um, we have um, uh, Carsten um, Marinholtz, um, who has a PhD in chemistry and an MBA from universities in Berlin and Cambridge. Um, he's co-founded co Cold Plasma Tech in 2015, um, and the team is described as developing a Star Trek-like medical device, which I'm really excited to hear more about, um, based on, on cold plasma um, and the treatment of chronic wounds and, um, um, and um, bacterial infections, including multi-resistant bacteria. Um, so with that, what I think um, the, the best way we may um, handle that is, I'm going to go down the line and ask each person to showcase um, their technology and how they're applying it to, um, to health. I'll ask each person, if you wouldn't mind, to just spend um, a couple of minutes first talking a little bit about um, what is the problem that um, you and your team or your company identified in health that you believed technology was um, an, an answer for, and then spend a few minutes talking um, about um, what, what your solution is. So let's start with, with Shari. No, I think it's off. Now it should work. Hi. <laughs> so as we are a clinic, we don't really have a product. Um, we work with several products um, with many startups as well. Our biggest challenge uh, is two-faced. So first of all, uh, rehabilitation takes a lot, of, a lot of time. So this is a problem because especially after stroke and a trauma, it's really, really hard for patients to motivate themselves to stick to their training and to stick for it for a long time. And the second challenge, of course, is it costs a lot of money. So for our healthcare system to pay for these weeks and months and even years of treatment, it's, it's very, very tough. So our focus is, uh, first of all, to motivate patients to make rehabilitation more fun. Um, I know this is... This is super difficult, as you can imagine, because everyone of you who has ever been with a physiotherapist knows it's just very, very stressful. And think about these stroke patients who, where everything is in line for them, where they ha really have to focus on changing their lives. It's, 
it's, it's much more difficult for them. And this, so we try to work with VR, with games, to engage people more in these activities. And the second part is, of course, people cannot stay in our clinic for uh, the whole treatment. They have to go back to their homes. And as we have many international patients, patients from, from anywhere in the world, they oftentimes don't find the setup they need to actually get better. So our focus is in hospital to home to bridge the gap between the clinic and the home setup through various devices. So we start with, of course, the most obvious one, telemedicine, but we want to move into a direction where we're doing a lot of research on sensors and um, technology to equip patients with the right devices to do treatment the right way, even in their home setup. That's it from you from now. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to come back. I have an, a question for you about um, 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 about the use of at home um, um, technologies. But we'll go down the road and then we'll come back and we'll talk about some of the um, the, the challenges. So, Shajil. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, at MMH Labs, we are trying to bring affordable solutions to everyone, especially in uh, developing countries. You know, we have a lot of uh, medical healthcare facilities available here, but those uh, facilities cannot reach out to uh, developing countries or even some parts in the United States. So what, uh, at MMH Labs, our vision is to bring affordable healthcare. But there's another thing. We want to do it in a very environment-friendly way. We want to uh, use sustainable materials. So you would be surprised to know that what we have been able to do is like, we have used as, uh, something as simple as a piece of paper or an aluminum foil, things that you can even find in your home, and we have made sensors out of them. And these sensors, uh, we, have, we have been demonstrating them for a while now. We have uh, made a Fitbit, something similar to a Fitbit, just using uh, paper, uh, sensors made out of paper. And I'm currently working on uh, an asthma monitor. And the sensor that I made uh, for monitoring asthma uh, I'm actually detecting the symptom of asthma that's wheezing, so just using a paper foil. So with the power of science and engineering, uh, I'm, try I'm empowering these simple uh, materials. And what's the advantage? So these things can reach out to everyone, you know, everyone in the whole world, especially, as I said, the developing countries. And the techniques we use, uh, we can even set up manufacturing plants in these countries, so it helps the economy. And the good thing is that since we are using recyclable materials, so there is, no, uh, there is less electronic waste. You know, electronic waste is becoming a big issue. Uh, about 60% of the electronic material we use go into the landfills, and they have carcinogenic materials like uh, cadmium, mercury, they seep into the landfill. And even when you try to recycle these materials, about 30% cannot even be recovered. So we, we, have, we are using, of course, some, some of the logic part is electronics, but the sensors we made are, are totally made out of uh, sustainable materials. So, and there's less uh, cost on the environment, and of course they're affordable, so they can reach out to everyone. That's all for now. Great. So Joseph. So thank you, Chris. Uh, the best way for me to introduce what we're doing is through a video, a short little presentation. I don't know if Aline has it set up on the computer. And I'll, so, I'll start. so maybe, maybe as um, when we when we get while we get your video up, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about what what is the challenge that um, that, that 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 you're um, addressing with your technology? Yeah, excellent question, and I think this goes back to um, what you were saying earlier about bringing bringing healthcare home. So we started our company about two years ago in wearables. Um, I have this passion, believing that that uh, we can wear our our healthcare on our back, so that. If you have a, an article of clothing that can detect an ailment and then impose some sort of a treatment in real time, you've, you've basically closed the loop rather than getting out to a healthcare provider. So with that in mind, we, we, uh, my partner and I, who met a couple of years ago, my partner is also an engineer and a patent attorney, we met a couple of years ago and he showed me this really incredible thing he had. And I'll show you the video. If you run the video real quickly, you'll see this. What we're seeing here is I have a sleeve on my arm that has an acceler accelerometer on it. And so the computer detects the hand motion that I make and it drives a signal into John's arm so that involuntarily his hand moves. And when we started working on this, we first thought, well, how can we use this? 
we, we figured, well, we could use this to train people athletic training or musical training or so on, and then we realized uh, his, his aunt actually had a stroke, and she ended up in a condition that's called contracture, and contracture leaves uh, patients with their arms almost like a club, and they've already gone through all of the physical therapy, all of the, the medical uh, treatment that's available. Here, now they've got the video moving. So you can see, and this is two years old, and I was trying to trick the machine by moving faster than it could keep up, and so this is an early prototype, and I'm gonna show you uh, where we are now. But that, that demonstrates the ability for an involuntary muscle uh, generation or muscle contraction on one part based on a signal driven by something else. So, so practical application of that is exactly stroke rehab at home. And we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. We're, we're currently funded um, under a program at, by Bayer in Germany developing a, a contracture product right now using this. So if you want to run through, I have a couple more quick slides if you want sure. to run through. These are the type of things on the left. You see the image of a contracture patient, the typical treatments that are available. And you can go right on through to the next one. And I'm going to show you. So this is um, a, an initial prototype of what our product looks like with a, a, an app and a real simple sleeve. And go on to the next one if you would. So here's a video. If you click on that video, you'll see this is a, a, a stroke patient who's, who's uh, 11 years, I'm sorry, 11 months out of uh, treatment. That's the best he can do with his hand. He can't raise his hand be, uh, beyond that, that initial position. Now with our sleeve on, he's, he's for the first time in 11 months getting motion in his hand again. And so you can see where, where this goes to is now you can send a patient home with a set of sleeves. They can now do simple things, uh, regain life skills like opening doorknobs and putting their pants on. And, and there's more to that story, but this is essentially what we're working on. And if you wanna keep going, Aline, to the next slide real quickly. Um, you know, the next, uh, you've already, this is already played. This is, so now what we're doing is we're taking that, uh, that core principle of, of involuntary muscle contractions and we're hooking it up with virtual reality. And when you do that, what you're doing is leveraging the, the brain's natural neuroplasticity to heal itself and you're, you're retraining, recreating the pathways between the brain and the afflicted limbs. So this is where we are right now. We're working on um, virtual reality uh, enabled stroke recovery using haptics. And we can stop there. And then there's more. We can, I have a demo we can do. We have uh, someone I'll bring up on stage. We can do a live demo. Great. Thank you. So my turn. Awesome stuff what you're doing. Um, my name is Karsten. I'm from Cold Plasma Tech. And um, as he said, as, um, as Cold Plasma Tech, uh, we developed a Star Trek-like medical device to basically solve two of the biggest problems in modern medicine. Um, the first problem being chronic wounds, so bad sores, diabetic feet, um, leg ulcerations and so on. So if you didn't get in touch with those uh, patients, imagine you're having a wound and the wound instead of closing goes deeper and deeper and doesn't close anymore. This is a huge problem in the US, there are around six to seven million patients suffering from those chronic wounds and everything that actually physicians do is putting new wound dressings on the wounds, which is actually also a big problem because, um, you know, patients are seen as clients. And if you have a chronic condition nowadays, it's a very good business case. So that's the first uh, problem we're tackling. The second one might be even bigger. Um, you all might have heard of multi-resistancy in bacteria. So basically that means antibiotics don't work as before. Um, Bacteria tend to get resistant to uh, antibiotics more and more. And a little story, um, I recently had a, a talk with a, uh, a postdoc from the National Reference Center for Multiresistant Bacteria in Germany. And we were talking about multiresistancies and there are things that are called reserve antibiotics. So they're held back because this is the last line of defense against multiresistancy. And there are reserve antibiotics that even go with nerve damage and so on. So this is really the last line of defense. And while I was sitting next to him in his talk, he was saying then so, and we just got noticed that in Asia, um, chicken farms are getting treated with these reserve antibiotics. So this is the brink of being in the Middle Ages again. So imagine a world without antibiotics. So these are two very serious problems. Um, and what we did basically is we looked at Star Trek. 
Um, so how does Star Trek solve wound problems? Uh, it's called Dermot Regenerator. It's a little handheld device that emits a blue light and if you cut yourself, you go over it and then the wound closes. What has been science fiction has become reality now. Um, the technology is, used, uh, is called cold plasma. Cold plasma is an ionized gas. Um, basically, it's bioactive. If you want to, if, if you're like curious about it, just ask me a question later and I go into deep physics. Um, but basically, it enhances wound healing on one hand, and on the other hand, it kills bacteria. Very high bacterial loads. We have a reduction of lock to the power of seven, which is very high because to the power of five is already decontamination. And uh, we built a product around this to make this technology applicable. And this is also what's very important when you speak about new technologies coming to markets. So the technology might be fancy and like coming from the future, but people need to work with this right now. So you need to make technology applicable in order to have physicians or health professionals work with it. And this is actually a big problem, um, at least in Europe and also, I guess, like everywhere in the world, because we have great technologies, but often scientists are not thinking about, hey, what are the needs in markets? So needs are the basis for product development. Um, and this is what basically we did. So the technology was there, it wasn't applicable before. We built wound dressings that ignite the cold plasma on full scale. We don't care about how big the wounds are, we don't care about how deep the wounds are. Um, the treatment time is two minutes and then it's done. So, so I'm going to start asking a couple of questions and then maybe we'll get on to a couple of demonstrations. I'm not sure how many of you have something to demonstrate. but. But I, I want to start with you, Carsten. Um, so, so we've heard four very interesting and very different technologies that are being um, brought to bear into healthcare, right? I mean, there's the Internet of Things and, and, and sensors being used in the home. There's sustainable um, technologies that are being used to create new biosensors, um, haptic technologies, cold plasma. So let me start with, I mean, the cold plasma um, one. Where, where, has this technology been deployed in other sectors before? I mean, how is it being used today? So, cold plasma is used, for example, in uh, um, many different kinds. You all know plasma state. Maybe I should start with explaining what plasma is. So, plasma is a state of matter. You all know um, solid, gas form, and liquid state of matter. If you put more energy in a gas, you can uh, get it to plasma state. So plasma are usually very hot, like the surface of the sun or lightnings. However, plasma is also available cold. Uh, in our case, tissue tolerable when you want to do wound healing with it. However, plasma is used, for example, uh, if you want to uh, shed light on something because it's in light bulbs. They work with plasma. Um, or plasma is used when you're welding. Plasma is used in uh, all kinds, like Infineon uses plasma when they're uh, doing their, uh, their microchips. You can uh, um, modify surfaces using plasma. And this is quite often that you have technologies that are emerging and then um, at some point, like after 20, 25 years of use, you come up with new solutions to, to new problems because you try out things um, as scientists. And um, that was one of them. Like, so treating tissues, we needed to make the plasma cold, tissue tolerable. And when it was tissue tolerable, then uh, scientists started to putting out bacteria on cells and they saw, well, that's interesting. So there are things happening there. Maybe that can be useful. So the research went deeper and deeper. And then it's like always with new technologies, you have for really, really new technologies, you always have like 20 year cycles. So it takes around 20 years from discovery to really ready market use and high penetration of the market. Um, and we are now in year around 15 of that technology. Yeah, terrific. I mean, this is an area that's of, of great interest to me and I think of great interest in, in Texas in general because Texas, um, for, for I think most people here will know that Texas is very well known for energy, right? And, and we're seeing an, an increase in the number of technologies that are coming from 
the oil and gas sector um, and that are being increasingly used in um, areas like healthcare and, and in other areas. So it's fascinating looking at how some of these technologies are coming across. Shaquille, I, I, I wonder if um, we could also, sorry, Shaquille, I wonder if we could um, talk a little bit about your sustainable um, sensors. So firstly, I don't know if you have something to show people. Um, if you do, is it on here or do you have a... I have them with me. Okay, maybe you may want to pull it out, um, but I'm interested as you do, um, to tell us a little bit about where, where do you see these sustainable biosensors being um, most applicable? So go forward five years and where, where are we going to see these sensors? So, yeah, of course, you're going to see them everywhere. So one of the things... That's the hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one of the things we are working on are like fall detectors. So, of course, it's in the buzz these days. Apple has come up with the fall detection mechanism inside their um, Apple Watch. But how many of us do have, uh, have an Apple Watch? So, and especially, you know, most of the people who suffer from uh, falling and uh, it's, be it's becoming dangerous, it's like the old people. And they don't even keep smartphones. And we were trying to figure out a solution that's simple, that can be like used by anyone. So we came up with this fall detector. So what's happening inside is like, as I said before, we are going to use sustainable materials. So there's pieces of metal in here and uh, copper foils. And with that, you have, uh, we have come up with a fall detector. So if you just look up at the cost of just the sensor itself, it will be like, it cannot even be more than even a dollar. So, and, so then we have combined some electronics inside it. So we did not want it to have uh, like Bluetooth connectivity because we don't want it to be connected to a smartphone. We want it to reach out to everyone. So we have integrated um, an SMS-based feature inside. So, and the good thing is like, um, you're not restricted by having a smartphone on you. The, Thankfully, we have the GSM availability and anywhere inside the world, not, even, not just in the United States. So the moment someone falls, this thing is going to send an SMS to not to even the caregiver, but uh, your emergency contacts. So yeah, we are looking forward like this thing uh, can come out as soon as possible, and it's going to reach out to everyone. And some of the other things is like if, if some of you might be aware about the pill dispensers in the market, if you try to look for one, you cannot find anything that's uh, even affordable. Things, uh, pill dispensers cost more than $1,000. Sometimes they are on a maintain, uh, annual maintenance basis. So what we try to do is like we have come up with a very simple solution and we have come up with this pill dispenser. So it's not, uh, it's a smart pill dispenser. So it's, this one's connected to your phone and you can, uh, you can put a timetable of the pills you, uh, uh, you want to take, and, and when it's time to take the pill, it's gonna dispense the pill, you will receive an SMS. And we wanted to keep it small, so you can, it, this can fit inside your uh, bags. So um, I, I, I can have a small demonstration. So it's currently now connected to my phone, and for now I'm just demonstrating, so I'll maybe tell it to dispense a few pills. So we have uh, two, two outlets. And uh, so you know the the challenge with that was you see it's trying to dispense up if you can hear so the challenge was that if you know the tablets come in all different sizes and their shapes so how to in, how to how to how to dispense them in one just one uh, place so we have come up with pretty unique designs we can uh, currently uh, dispense about ten different kind of pills just from one platform so another thing we have been working on is. Uh, so another expertise of our group at MMH Lab is, yeah, it's still going to keep doing it. <laughs> so uh, it's stretchable materials. So we have come up with this uh, smart patch. It's a thermal patch for physiotherapy, and it's, it's stretchable. So you know, um, currently the patches you have available in the market are chemical-based. They're only one-time use, and you can only put them in certain locations. For an elbow, there will be a different one for an wrist. So we are experts in stretchable technologies. If you go up to our um, YouTube channel, MMH Labs, you would see that the kind of work we do. So the idea behind this is that you can put it on your arm. You can even stretch it out and uh, attach it to your elbow or even your knees. So, and again, the idea is to keep things simple. We don't want to make it complicated. So it's as simple as connecting a battery to it. So it will start heating up, and we have optimized it that it heats up only to the level that you want the physiotherapy to be. So I can connect it if you want. 
Um, that's right. Well, yeah, I can ask you a very quick question. Yes. I know that in five years' time you want these to be everywhere. Yes. Um, this is the result of work that is coming out of your lab um, at KAUST. Yes. Um, so I guess my question, maybe I'll revise my question. In which market do you expect to start deploying these? I mean, they're obviously predicated on being simple and, um, and, and being able to be deployed in low um, resource environments. So where do you anticipate um, starting to release some of your products? So uh, we, we plan to start off from the developing countries, like uh, some of the countries in uh, Africa and Southeast Asia and South Asia. So and the thing is, like, we can, the, the way our technologies are, we can even set up the manufacturing plants in those countries so that they, it can help their economy and we can reach out to everyone. Terrific. So, Shari, um, if I could ask you, you, you talked before about um, um, something that I think is um, a, a big issue in rehabilitation, but it's frankly, it's a big issue in a lot of um, um, health environments, and that is how to um, continue care once a patient has left a, um, a, a primary care site. And, and you're focused a, a lot on um, work in, in um, sensors at home. But I know that you also have an interest in um, um, the regulation and in privacy issues relating to these things. So I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot because um, this wasn't exactly why you um, came to the panel. But, um, but it, I mean, it is an issue that, that, that we hear about almost daily now in the media is, um, you know, as technologies become more invasive in our day-to-day -day lives and um, privacy laws um, are beginning to perhaps catch up and grapple with some of these things. I'm just interested in your opinion, um, and I know that this, I'm asking you to answer this in a short space of time, and I know you could probably speak for a long period on this, but I'm interested in your thoughts on, um, particularly your experience in Europe um, um, in that space, um, what, what's the most significant um, um, hurdle that, that you are facing as you um, are starting to think about at-home care in that, in that respect? Yeah, it's actually a very interesting question because if, if we had the same panel in Germany now, everybody would be annoyed already at this question because <laughs> privacy issues is one of the biggest hurdles for any entrepreneur in Germany. And I think all the Germans here People will here agree with People here might be me. annoyed already, yes. <laughs> even though we're in Austin. So. <laughs> but it's an interesting question and it's very, very, very important. If we think about, for example, you talked about a fall detector. This, of course, makes sense. Like a doctor or an emergency unit wants to be notified when an old person, patient falls in their home. Right? But if we think a bit further what sensors and technology in our homes can do, in our case, for example, tracking how often and how long people do their training, it's interesting who we share the data with. Right? Maybe my physician wants to know how often I did training and will remind me that I have to do more training units or my family members. And um, there we go into a direction that can be a bit dangerous, I'd say. And even one step further would be notifying your insurance companies that you don't do your training properly. So I think um, in this case, Germany or Switzerland, Europe in general can be an advantage uh, for developing these technologies because as I mentioned before, we have quite high expectations when it comes to data security and privacy. And I think we need to think more about these directions technology is evolving and I hope that by having a discussion between the US, who is a bit more open, I'd, I'd say, to, to these issues, and Europe, who is a bit more restrictive, we can find um, kind of a middle ground that will allow innovation, but also prevent um, any negative outcomes these might have. Terrific. So I, I want to just pause for one second and just see if there are questions in the audience, and then maybe we'll come back um, at this time to see if we can do a... Yeah, yeah, of course, Sorry. please too. Sorry, thank you. I, I just want to add a little point to what you were just saying there. One of the things that we're finding working with Bayer and we're working with, with patients right now is better patient outcome is a big driver in the decisions we make in digital health right now. And the other one is patient adherence. There's, there's over 400 unique, if you study patient adherence, there's over 400 unique reasons why a patient won't adhere to their medication protocol. 
And that's, that's huge. It, it, we have many, many technical solutions. As, and as technologists, we often are, are quick to jump in and create a technical solution. But one of the real problems is it's still a human problem. There's still people at the other end that have to adhere to this thing and try it. So, so anything we can do as innovators to create technology that is a, both affordable and practical and something that, that patients can take home with them is a huge win. It's, it's a big part of it. And one of the things, and as you know very well, and in America in particular, the, the statistics are saying that, that stroke alone is, is considered a $1 billion per day problem. And that's not because of the individual patient, the cost of individual patients. It's because of the secondary and tertiary problems associated with getting these patients to the healthcare provider. A typical stroke patient in the United States is 62 years old. They can't drive a car after a stroke. Their grown adult children who have children themselves now have the onus of bringing their aging parent to the healthcare provider. Well, that doesn't happen. So anything we can do to put products on these patients that they can exercise at home is a big win. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks. Yeah, terrific. It, this is, yeah, the, this is not the first time that I've heard today um, people make that distinction between technology and, 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 and humans, right? And remembering that at the end of the day, we're still trying to solve human problems. Um, um, let me just see if there's any questions in the audience. Yes. I have to admit, I've not heard anything about cold plasma before I used for wound therapy. Sounds fascinating. Um, one question that popped up into my head, and I'm going to get more educated later on, but if you could help me now, is a lot of times uh, when you're trying to do things like destroy bacteria in a wound, you wind up inadvertently destroying other things. That's with chemotherapy and other therapies that we do um, directed at one um, thing, especially when they're physical treatments that are physically physical agents. So we'd just like to understand, you know, whatever you can educate me on that part. So if I understand... May I answer? Yeah. So, if I understood you right, is like if you're killing bacteria, you're also prone to harm other like damaged tissues and so on and so forth. This is actually true. Um, so, maybe shortly I explain how plasma works because plasma is a whole bunch of active physical chemical substances active components that are interacting with biological tissue and also bacteria. Um, and what's, what's funny about this is that cold plasma induces stress in biological systems on many ways, uh, in cells as well in, as in bacteria. And now comes the trick. The plasma can't differentiate between cells and bacteria. It just like does what it does. It induces stress. However, cells are way better at dealing with stress while bacteria are dying when they're under stress because bacteria are much simpler st structures. They don't have stress response systems and so on and so forth. So they would die immediately. Um, and so there is like, there is a curve you can look at. Um, for our device, it's about three minutes treatment and you would induce apoptosis. Apoptosis would mean that cells would be dying due to stress. However, if you stand below those three minutes, our treatment, as I said, is around two minutes, you induce enough stress for those cells to secrete growth hormones, cytokines, induce cell migration, and so on and so forth. Um, if you're interested in this, what biologically happens, just answer another question, uh, just, just ask another question. And in these two minutes, the cells aren't harmed, but all bacteria are dying. And if you stay in these two minutes, everything's fine. And now comes the technical implication on that, because the first approaches of these technologies were handheld devices. So a physician deciding how long to treat a patient. Let me give you one example. There is some sort of plasma jets. And these jets, um, they treat a square centimeter. So when you're treating with them, you need to count in your head until 60 in order to go to the next square centimeter. And you do that for 30 minutes, 60 minutes. So imagine a physician sitting there 60 minutes doing this and then going to the next part. And so, so they wouldn't do that. So, and that's the problem. Because if a technology is not applicable, they would do this and whatever. So 
um, our solution then was exactly identifying this problem, meaning so it could be harmful at a certain point. So we just decided to actually leave out the um, treating person. So our technology is just put on the wound by our wound dressing and then a button is pushed and that's it. Everything else is automatic. So you have a hands-free treatment. Um, actually, this was seen very critically by many uh, um, consultants because before we started doing that, everyone told us, no, 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 the physician has to decide what's happening because physicians can decide that. Well, they can't. They don't know what plasma is and they don't know how it works. So when we then started, and this is where disruption comes in, you know, just deciding basically, and it's also what you said, like you have to listen to needs in the market but a good startup or a good entrepreneur is then deciding what needs are the relevant needs that I need to take in and what's presented to you that may, might have another, might be biased, might have another reason why it's presented to you. And you just skip those. And that makes then a technology or an application of a technology disruptive because you're skipping the bad parts, keeping the good parts, and thus having a technology applicable. And this was our decision too, to say, okay, so the worst problem could be uh, a physician over-treating a patient which would cause to t cell damage. Um, and so we left them out. So this can't happen anymore. Is this your question answered? Like, yeah. Sure. Carsten might be able to actually test out the cold plasma if you want, so. <laughs> All right, another question? Yeah. I'll circle back to, uh, to adherence to both of you with the doctor and uh, the medical device. I'm a therapist that works primarily with Parkinson's, and adherence, I think, is a really big issue. But you're talking about cutting out friction. I, I, I look more towards the gamification to make it more interesting. I find that a lot of times the making it easier doesn't help me as much as making it something that I really want to do or make it compelling. I mean, do you have any, any thoughts about that with your game or versus what you're doing with stroke, which is a much harder population to motivate, I find? So, so I'll, thank you. That's a great question. And the question was uh, not just to to overcome the resistance that a patient has to adhere to whatever the treatment protocol is, but how about making it interesting? And so, the, so you brought up gaming, and, and actually I didn't really enunciate that with the image that you saw, or the short video that, that was up earlier. That is a game. That's the beginning of a game. We're working with virtual reality uh, game developers right now to tie the, the, the visual and audio cues that the patient sees with our haptic interaction device. And, and I think that that's a really, really smart way to go because uh, the Wii proved it, actually. I don't know if you know this, but um, one of the major consumers of the Wii product for years were geriatric patients, and it got them off the couch. And so it's a great idea. It's a really interesting question. And my favorite quote from our hospital is a patient told us that he wants to stop playing games and finally he starts training. So I think this is, this is a good sign, but there's also many negative aspects to it. So we work um, with several robotic devices who have implemented games and it's great, it's a great add-on, but um, many movements aren't as natural yet as they should be. So I think we really have to figure out how we make these games better, how we make um, these movements more significant and uh, more fun for patients. But for me, for now, this is just an add-on in a direction where we're moving towards to, but we are not there yet. Terrific. Well, um, we've actually run out of time. Um, so um, there's a, um, yeah, it goes quick. Just quickly when, um, um, when you were talking about so many exciting things. So um, first off, um, please join me in thanking um, these um, great innovators um, working on technologies of the future. I won't quite say yet that I'm looking forward to getting sick, but, um, but it is uh, making it easier to, 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 to get there. But, um, but so thank you, and I'm hoping, I haven't um, verified this with any of them, but I'm hoping that, that some of them will be able to um, hang around if any of you have questions off to the side. Um, um, so um, with that, um, I guess I'll hand back over to Eileen and you know what's happening next. Great. Yes, I do. <laughs> Great, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris.